Great, thank you. This recording will be posted up on our website. We have a quick link on the left-hand side of our homepage that says update on org standards and Roman next gen. We'll definitely put it there and it'll probably pop up a few other places as well. So keep an eye out for that if you want to re-listen to something today or pass the recording along to colleagues in your organization. Also want to let folks know that we had a tremendous response. We had over 400 or over 500 and so folks, 550 folks register for today's webinar, which is phenomenal. But that also means we're not going to be able to unmute folks. It's just way too many, which is great um, on that side of things because we're getting the word out. So if you have questions, I encourage you to use the Q&A window on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Go ahead and type questions in. We have some folks behind the scenes who are going to be compiling those questions. And I'm going to keep an eye on the screen up here. When you see me look up, that means I'm looking at the screen behind, behind you uh, so I can kind of see what the questions are coming in and we can get to those today. So um, as we get started here today, again, please use that Q&A window. If we don't get to your questions today, email them to us and we will do our best to get back to you with any particular questions you may have. We're also going to be reaching out to the Regional Performance Innovation Consortia, the RPICs, to see if there's an interest in each region of the country to do localized regional listening sessions about the IM, which would give folks more of a chance to uh, have more of a dialogue about, the, about IM 138. So let's get rolling. So again, please put your questions into the Q&A box. So today's agenda, what we want to do is walk through IM 138, just as IM 82 and IM 49 are kind of now in, in our lexicon and community action, IM 138 is going to be a critical IM for us to understand, to take a deep dive into, to have it the ready as we look to the next couple of years of community action. As you know, we've been waiting for this for a while and we're thrilled to have it out. So today we're going to walk through um, what's in the IM. We're going to walk through some of the changes on what happened with the, the organizational standards. There are a few tweaks here and there. There are two new additional standards that we want to make sure folks are familiar with. We're going to talk about what the IM tells us about implementation, assessment, and then oversight by states. And I know we have states on the call listening. We also have OCS on the call listening to try to make sure that, as well as agencies and associations, so we have the whole network here really to ask questions and dialogue. And so we can really keep track of what the core questions might be for some later conversation as well. We're going to touch on a little bit the two other um, pieces that came out this week. I, um, OCS has been very busy this week releasing information. Earlier this week, in addition to IM-138, there was a Dear Colleague letter with a draft IM on state and accountability measures. We're going to touch on that a little bit. And just last night, there was an IAM, that, or a Dear Colleague letter, excuse me, that came out around the draft model state plan and the OMB clearance process. And we'll touch on that as well because both of those components touch on organizational standards. Let's go to the next slide. This is an OCS slide that I borrowed from our January conference. I think it's a nice way to kind, kind of start off the conversation, making sure that everyone on the call understands the linkages of all three of these projects. We have the organizational standards component, which gets to organizational capacity issues. We have the federal and state accountability measures, which is going to get to state efficiency issues and effectiveness. And then we're going to be getting later on, we can touch a little bit on Roman Next Generation a little bit. We know there's a lot of products coming out of NASCAS with Roman Next Generation. Again, a very exciting time for things to be coming out. And so that's the third component that really gets to the outcomes and how we tell our story in community action and how we document the impact we have with families. And this visual is actually in IM138, and I know uh, the team at OCS has used this in the field when they're out doing presentations as well. This is kind of a nice graphical representation of, again, how all of these components fit together. We talk about organizational standards and accountability measures for states and feds, again, on how well did our network in terms of performance versus what difference did our network make, which is really where we get around Roman Next Generation and the National Performance Indicators. Again, the organizational standards really are focused on organizational capacity. And the more we've been talking about it and thinking about it, it's been interesting for me that we oftentimes talk about the unique components of community action, certainly around the tripartite board, the local decision making with federal resources, the needs assessment, and how that impacts our services. But the organizational standards are going to be another hook for us to talk about the unique elements of our network. So it's kind of an exciting time to have another component that talks about all of our agencies across the country are meeting these organizational standards that allows us to talk about the, the core 
organization network capacity to take in federal resources as well as other funding and provide effective services in our community. So let's get into IM-138. As you recall, this was released just this past Monday, uh, January 26th. The IM is up on our website as well as OCS's website. If you can't find it, shoot us an email and we'll make sure you get a link to it, if not a PDF copy of the IM. It is entitled State Establishment of Organizational Standards for CSBG Eligible Entities under the CSBG Act. Because again, as we've talked about kind of from day one, these standards really flow through, again, the Act, but because it's a block grant, these fall underneath state's authorities to set the standards. And we're gonna talk about some of those core elements as well. What, does the, what are some of the broad story or broad components of IM-138? Again, no surprise here. This is what we heard in the draft IM um, earlier this spring, what we've heard from OCS in the field, that this summer states will be, as they compile their state plan for 2016, putting in elements about addressing the standards implementation in each state. In addition, for states that submitted a state plan last September 1st, we'll need to submit an addendum to that plan to talk about their implementation of organizational standards. And we also know across the country, different states have different contract years, whether they start 10-1, some start 1-1, some start April 1st. So it's really may vary across the country. I think we even have a June or a July start date out there as well. So there may be some unique elements around the country about when things kind of kick into gear based on your CSBG contract years. But for the most part, 10-1, 2015, which is the start of federal fiscal year 2016, will kind of be the moment in time where states will need to implement organizational standards. This will have an impact on state plans, an impact on monitoring in the field, as well as the annual report that the states will submit at the close of, of this, this, of this fest, the next federal fiscal year, where they're gonna be talking about how did, well did organizations do in terms of meeting organizational standards. In the state plan, states will need to identify and make a decision what set of standards they're going to be using. And we've talked about this as well in the field, that they will either choose to use the center of excellence or what we're calling the COE developed standards. Those are the standards developed by the working, the CSBG working group here at the partnership through the CS, or through the organizational standards center of excellence. In the IM, OCS does recommend that states use the COE developed standards. They see them as robust, they see them as reflective of community action, vision, and values, and that they reflect, again, core elements of the Act, as well as OMB, as well as other rules and requirements, again, that kind of give us a good firm foundation. But again, because it's a block grant, states do have the flexibility to make some modifications or changes. So they can modify the standards. They're gonna to have to talk about that modification in their proposed state plan, and that's gonna need OCS approval. States may also choose to use their own set of standards if they feel they have an already existing robust set of standards that they would rather use instead. They could use that, but there's gonna be a process they're gonna to need to go through to have those approved. This slide really kind of gets to, again, those states, of, uh, states authorities that it talks about in IM-138, that again, it references the act that requires state CSBG lead agencies to establish performance goals, administrative standards, financial management requirements and other requirements that ensure an appropriate level of accountability and quality amongst eligible entities. And I'll just pause here and say they, they really use the term CSBG eligible entities. I may slip and use community action agencies or CAP agencies. For most of us, that's gonna be synonymous with one another, but the IM does use the term CSBG eligible entities. Second of all, in order for states to meet these responsibilities under the Act, the states must establish, communicate, and hold accountable to clear and comprehensive standards as part of their oversight duties. So again, as we've been talking really about over the last year here around how we think this is gonna roll out, it does fall within the state's authorities. Let's go to the federal authority slide. And again, these slides and this recording will be up on our website for folks to download and use for your own organization's purposes. So the federal authority, the statute provides the authority to, for the feds to, or for the states to collect such information, or the feds, excuse me, to collect such information as the secretary shall require, including a series of detailed assurances based on the requirements of the act. To assure effective use of funds to meet the purposes of this act or the statute, states that the secretary may prescribe procedures for the purpose of assessing effectiveness of the eligible entities in carrying out the purposes of their act. 
So again, some of the core components here, and I guess sort of the technicalities of how some of this is working, is to collect such information that the secretary will require. So that's why when we talk about OMB clearance, and we're going to talk about the state plan, and we're going to talk about the annual report, that's how the feds are going to be working within that data collection structure around organizational standards. So when it goes to OMB for clearance, it's not about the language of the standards, because again, those were COE, Center of Excellence Developed Standards, but that process for data collection in terms of how the state plan frames up org standards as well as the annual report is kind of how these all pieces all fit together. Again, I know that's a very technical piece of it, but that I think it's an important element. We'll pause here in just a couple of minutes and to see if there are any core questions coming in, um, but we'll take here a few more slides. So again, just some reminders to make sure we're all on the same page. The, the CSBG Working Group and the Center of Excellence submitted the proposed standards back on July 10th, 2013, about a year and a half ago. They are up on our website still, so you can compare the IM to the, to the previous version. They've been under review by HHS, um, OCS, and through their entire process. It's been an extensive review process, is my understanding, at HHS. As you know, anything that kind of comes out the other side through these um, systems really need to be vetted by a number of different layers. And at the same time, OCS was navigating certainly Roman Next Generation, the state and federal accountability measures. There are a lot of moving parts at OCS that have to happen to, for, the, for the standards to roll out, which is kind of the reason why it's taken quite a bit of time. There have been a lot of ducks they've had to get in a row and a lot of review processes they've had to go through. So again, we're thrilled to be here, but it was an extensive period of time. So OCS did come back to the partnership in the Center for Excellence saying, here's the results of our review. Here are some of the tweaks that we had. Here are some of the suggestions. Can you at the Center of Excellence walk through these and see if there's a way that, um, if there's any changes that the Center of Excellence would recommend back to OCS? So we had a very um, recent meeting of the CSBG Working Group where we dove into the, to the comments to the recommendations, to some of the tweaks of language, and the Center of Excellence dialogue talked about it, provided additional changes back to OCS and said, here's where we think as a CSBG working group in the Center of Excellence, we can land in terms of making modifications to our proposed standards and still say they really are the Center of Excellence developed standards. So the standards that are in the IM are the COE developed standards and approved by the CSBG working group. But that does mean that there are two new additional standards. So instead of 56, we now have 58 for the nonprofit, um, private community action agencies or eligible entities, and 50 for the public CAPS or the public CSBG eligible entity. And as we talked about during the development phase, that's not because there's, there's fewer, there's just different ways that public entities meet certain organizational standards, whether it's around finance, HR and legal governance works differently in a public cap than it does in a private cap. But you can see here the last paragraph, we do believe that these modifications certainly fit within the spirit and intent of the standards and really reflect the core elements that the working group took to heart when they developed the first set of recommended standards around balance and compliance with high performance, reflecting the vision and values of community action, being straightforward, and again, you may remember those listening sessions where we talked about can we meet the standard or not meet the standard? Is it a clear line of delineation uh, to help us make sure that when people are assessing us, it's an easy kind of line to draw on the sand, yes or no? So, <clears throat> next slide. We do remain with three thematic areas with nine core areas. Again, maximum feasible participation, vision and direction, and operations and accountability. We maintain the nine areas of customer input and involvement, community engagement, et cetera. None of these change. We've, again, just added two standards. So let's talk about what's changed. But before we do that, why don't we, are there any questions that have come in the door that we should be responding to so far? Does the IM give states new broader powers to designate or de-designate community action agencies? Good question. No, it does not. There's nothing here in the IM that, that addresses designation or de-designation of, of, or designation of new caps. What it does address, though, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is the assessment of agencies about organizational standards and training and technical assistance plans to help agencies meet the organizational standards. But it clearly says um, the meet, not meeting standards is not uh, an element to go down this road um, for 
um, D designation, and it refers agencies and states back to IM-116, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Question, when state, would states operating on a state fiscal year utilize the state fiscal year 2016 as their baseline for reporting rather than the federal fiscal year, thus requiring states would not need to be fully compliant? This is one of the states that has a different start date for their CSBG contract here. And we'll, we'll add this to our list of questions to take back to OCS for some clarification. And again, this is just Denise and um, talking based on our experience, because it depends probably how you're backed up in terms of when your state plan takes effect. Um, and when your contract with OCS and how that works, we'll get some clarification about when that would start for individual states with different fiscal years. Um, I I'm, don't know for sure which one way or the other. I would lean toward it starts when your fiscal year starts the next time around. I can't imagine that you would have to start this, this summer with your fiscal year and the standards, but we'll, we'll get some clarification from you for you from OCS as well and get back to you. Question, can the states use both, their own monitoring process plus the standards? Yes. Um, we're going to talk about how you can integrate that as states, and there's some recommendations in the IM that talk about the, and tries to address the issues about the triannual monitoring. Some states monitor every other year, some states monitor every year, and how that fits. I do know that I have had states from, or questions from states that say, can we replace our monitoring with the standards? And the answer to that, I would say, is no. You can't replace the standards for your monitoring. The monitoring is a much broader process. You're going to be assessing a lot of different things. So you're still going to do your state monitoring. We're hoping that the standards become kind of a subset of those elements that you're using in your monitoring process. All right. Um, so we will – a question has come in. We'll, let's flag that question for a little bit later, Cash, and that would be great. So let's walk through now what has changed in some of the organizational standards. Here's one of the two new standards, 3.4. The community assessment includes key findings on the causes and conditions of poverty and the needs of the communities assessed. This is going to both be the same really for the private cap and the public cap. I do think that this is a significant change and to make sure that folks are going to be aware of this change. This adds a new component to the needs assessment standard. I think it's a good component because it really tries to get to really what the spirit of our community action comprehensive community needs assessment should do. So you will probably need them. We, this will, we will do some technical assistance, we'll do some training, and we'll put some tools up on our website that will help identify, again, how agencies can do this. But my guess is the vast majority of needs assessments have a key finding section. So when you do your needs assessment, did you find what are the top 10 key issues that have come out of your community assessment? What are the top needs in our community? If your assessment has that kind of executive summary or key finding section, check. You've met that standard. If you're going to also then be talking about the causes and conditions of, of poverty in your community, my guess is the vast majority of CAPS will do that as well. And talking about the broader thematic issues that are going on here in your community. What are the issues about the need for living wage jobs in our community? That's a very large macro systemic, systemic issue in our community. The availability and need for affordable housing, transportation systems. There are going to be some broader issues about those causes and conditions of poverty that I think it's going to be um, reflective in this standard. And again, when we provide training on needs assessments, I know we work in concert a lot with NASCASP on training around those issues. We'll make sure to add some components around how do agencies demonstrate that they've met this particular standard. We'll walk through these um, new standards and modifications, and we'll come back to see if there are questions specific to the standards as well. So let's go to the new 4.4. The governing board receives, excuse me, an annual update on the success of specific strategies included in the Community Action Plan. Same thing here on the public side, that the tripartite advisory body receives an annual update on the specific strategies included in the CAP plan. Now, Many of you recall that in the standards there are elements around the strategic plan, that the organization's board needs to get updates on the progress toward meeting the goals of that strategic plan on an annual basis as well. This is around your CAP plan, and I know in some places the CAP plan and strategic plan are very closely aligned with one another, and I've gotten some phone calls from folks saying, aren't they the same thing? And we've had conversations back saying, I really do see those elements as separate components, that your strategic plan is around organizational 
vision, mission, goals for the future that is agency-wide. And certainly a lot of CAP plans are going to be agency-wide as well, but that's much more around how what your plans are for this year, maybe for this two-year window. It's oftentimes the documents you submit to the state in terms of how, what you're going to be doing over the course of the year or, again, for the two-year period. So this just basically says, in addition to your strategic plan update to the board, you're going to update your board on your CAP plan progress. Again, my guess is the vast majority of you are doing this already. This will be another element that kind of goes on the board calendar that we hope to develop soon, kind of what are you doing over the course of the year and what are some of the elements that a board can expect to see as part of their board reporting. Let's walk through one more um, on the significant modification. So those are the two new ones. This one, um, 9.3, I think has some significant modifications that I'm putting it into a different category than just modified. So under private community action agency, the organization has presented to the governing board for reviewer action, at least with, once within the past 12 months, an analysis of the agency's outcomes, as well as any or operational or strategic program adjustments and improvements identified as necessary. You can see the previous original languages at the bottom of the slide. The organization has analyzed its outcomes within the past 12 months. So the organization looked at its outcomes, looked at what it was doing at least once within the calendar year. This modification, though, it really embraces the whole, I think almost the whole foundational element of why we're doing all these changes to our performance management system. Early on, we tried defining, you know, we talk performance measurement, right? We, we count what we do. We're tracking our outcomes through the NPIs. Performance management, though, really is what are we modifying based on what we know? If you look at the Roma cycle, we have our planning, our assessment, we have our planning, we have our implementation, we collect our data, but that final hook of the Roma cycle really is an analytical piece. So this component really talks about you're reviewing what's gone on over the course of the past year, and you're making any operational or strategic program adjustments or improvements that have been identified as necessary. Now, if your organization, your board says, we're fine, there are no changes that need to be made, you're good to go. The idea is that that conversation takes place, that analysis takes place, how are you going to document that? It'll probably be in a committee minute, maybe in your full board minute, that that process actually happen. But again, nothing here says you're going to have to make changes, but that you're going to have that conversation and that perhaps you've identified what changes may need to happen. Again, we'll provide some training, technical assistance. Again, this is a, a relatively, I think, a significant shift, so we'll be providing some guidance on this as well. So I'm going to pause to see if there are questions on any of the new standards or the significant changes. Can you give some specific examples of um, specific strategies for 4.4? <clears throat> So, the Governing Board receives an annual update on the success of specific strategies included in your Community Action Plan. So, you may have some specific strategies identified in your CAP plan around number of units of housing going to be created over the course of an 18-month window, whether it's the CSBG, housing funds, private resources. That may be part of your CAP plan that you're going to, you're going to create 20 new units of affordable housing in XYZ neighborhood. And I think you would then report on the progress of, of movement on how that is going over the course of the year. So if your target was to develop 20 new units, 12 months in, you've, you've gotten certain groundwork laid, you've talked with certain parties, you have certain contracts in place, you're getting ready to move into the development phase, that kind of update would be something I think that could possibly fit into that category. What other questions do we have? What is Community Action Partnership and OCS doing to help encourage states to get us a computer system that will allow us to maintain our data on outcomes and reporting? It's always a good question to have be raised around getting computer systems and IT in place to really help us maintain data on outcomes and reporting. We understand that that is a significant challenge. We have, oftentimes agencies will have, the vast majority of agencies will certainly have multiple systems in order to track services and to track outcomes. I know many of us are challenged by how do we put that into a singular spot to, to articulate what we're doing, what the impact we have, and what difference we're making in families' lives. Now, in the org standards, we get to systems or systems. There's no call to have a singular system, but I know the partnership is an ongoing conversation with agencies. Our board is very attuned to the need for 
uh, data standards, for data systems, and uh, we, we are committed to having those conversations go forward. So I know that's a core element on a lot of people's mind. I know so OCS has talked about those issues as well. We recognize it as a real issue, and we will continue to, to struggle with those issues and communicate with the network about what progress we're making. I don't have any solid answers for you today, though, but feel free to email me, call me, and we can have some additional conversations about that. Move on, then? Okay, great, good questions. Thank you for sending them in. Let's go to some other modifications of note. Now, throughout the document of the IM 138, if you look at the individual standards you lay side by side, there will be some tweaks, right? We've moved from community action agency to eligible entity. We talked in the proposed standards about OMB Circular A133. In the IM, it talks about um, the consolidated super circular, not, doesn't say it's super circular, but it uses the technical language for what the super circular is. So there are those minor modifications, but today we really wanted to highlight what we thought were more, more notable um, modifications. So 2.1, the organization has documented or demonstrated partnerships across the community for specifically identified purposes. Partnerships include other anti-poverty organizations in the, in the area. You can see the previous version. There is this for specifically identified purposes. Now, we've talked a lot about the standard in the field. There are often questions about this one. This does not say you have to have documentation backing up all of your partnerships. We know many of you have, whether it's informal partnerships, you even have formal partnerships, but there may not be an MOU or an MRA or a contract or any sort of financial arrangement. Um, there may not even be an official membership list. But we know that you do have partnerships that are much more formalized. And this basically doesn't say you have to have X number of partnerships, but it means that we want to see documentation of some of the core, core partnerships that you have in the community that may have an MOU or an MOA. I was just with a group um, this week in the Midwest, and we talked about examples, for instance, if you're the lead agency on a teen pregnancy prevention grant, and you have subcontractors, that's going to be a partnership. If you're the member of an anti-violence coalition that's looking to decrease um, violence in a certain community, and you're a member of that group, and there's a membership list, and there's bylaws, or there's other um, governance policies for those formalized coalitions, that might also meet the that would probably that that would meet the requirements from our perspective. So there are a lot of different ways to, to meet this standard, but this does not mean to say there has to be any one particular way to, to meet that. Two point two. Again, inserting the language during community assessment process or at other times. So the organization utilizes information gathered from key sectors of the community in assessing needs and resources. Initially, we felt that that implied the community assessment process, but again, here in the model, in the final language, we do clearly articulate you're using that information during your community assessment or other times. There might be other opportunities where you're using that information over the course of the year or, the, or every other year, whatever your process is on your needs assessment process. 4.6, one more term kind of put in here, an agent, an organization-wide comprehensive risk assessment that's been completed in the past two years and reported to the governing board. Again, in the training we did on the standard, we oftentimes talk that it's a comprehensive risk assessment. This allowed us to put that term in here that it's not just an HR assessment, it's just not just a financial assessment, it's an agency-wide comprehensive risk assessment. And we still see that the tool that we have up on our website, the, uh, the needs assess or the, assess the risk assessment tool, excuse me, developed in partnership with the Nonprofit Risk Management Center, helps agencies meet the standard in a low cost way. Now, certainly that tool takes time to complete, and we know that there's certainly a cost to staff time and board time to do that. But it's something that you don't have to necessarily go outside of the agency to bring in a consultant to do, although many agencies also do that. So that tool is still there and up on our website for your year use. Uh, for, um, the mo another modification, that the governing board has received an update on the progress meeting the strategic plan within the past 12 months. So again, the previous language of the governing board has received an update on meeting the goals of the strategic plan. We're just throwing in the word progress again to talk again more about that movement. What happened in the last 12 months as you've made movement on modifying or making progress on your strategic plan. 9.1 and another one on nine. I didn't put all the numbers on here, my apologies. So 9.1, the organization has a system or systems in place to track and report client demographics and services. The previous one just said services, and again, 
system or systems, so you're going to have multiple systems possibly, but you're already doing this, right? You're having to report the demographics and your IS report every year. Again, this is, again, what, a lot of these standards have an element of telling the story to the broader public about what we're doing as a network. This, again, is just clarifying that you have systems in place to track the demographics. And again, if you go to the following slide, that your IS report data report, that you do submit your annual re IS report, and it reflects both client demographics and organization-wide outcomes. The previous proposed version just had outcomes. Again, we're adding the client demographics. You're doing this already. Again, this adds the element of, again, telling the broader story to the broader public, to policymaker and others, that we're also reporting our client demographic information. So I'm going to pause here and see if there are questions that have come in on any of these. See nothing so far. So those were pretty straightforward, so good. So let's get to possibly what's more the, the interesting stuff on some of this, right? First question we usually get in the field, well, what happens to me if we don't meet standards? So let's get into the assessment and state oversight pieces. So IM-138 does talk about the responsibilities, again, of the state CSBG lead agency to establish and communicate expectations and organizational standards to entities across the state. They're going to assess the status of standards at all agencies annually. That is clear in the standards, and we'll talk about this in a moment, that every year, the agencies need to be compliant with the organizational standards and there needs to be a process in place that states will assess agencies and how they're doing against those organizational standards. And then they're going to be reporting to OCS on that level to which agencies meet the standards in their annual report. So let's go to the next slide. States may design an approach for assessing their organizational standards that fit within the existing oversight framework of the state. There's nothing in the IM that says states, thou shalt do it this way. Um, I think we've heard some of this in the last few months from OCS as we've been dialoguing in the field with when we're at state association events and our national events that what happens if I assess an agency every three years? How does this happen? So again, there's nothing here that says a state shall do it any one way. So this does give states flexibility, but I know sometimes it's easier to have a, a straight up black and white answer on some of this, but there are several examples laid out in IM-138. So many states may integrate standards assessment into their regular CSBG monitoring procedures, while other states may choose different oversight approaches, such as peer review, assessment by a consultant or third party, or self-assessment. Some states may choose a hybrid approach, um, integrating a couple of these strategies. If you use one of those outside strategies, however, states must ensure the assessment of standards is independently verified by the state or by a third party. And I think there's a, a couple of nice examples in here that kind of talk about what that means. For instance, a state that's on a triannual monitoring process. So um, the Act says that at minimum, states need to monitor agencies every three years. Many states, however, monitor every two years, and some states do it every year. And some states have much more frequent visits, even quarterly, um, by their state monitors. But a formal, larger monitoring may happen only once every three years. So even if you're on that triannual piece, so in between the monitoring visit, the state may require agencies to do a self-assessment. If not, I'm kind of using the term desk audit a lot of times when I talk about this that so in those intervening years, can an agency take a tool, and I know many of you have used the tool we have up on our website, some states have adapted the tool for their own use, that agencies complete, yes, we met this standard, we met this standard, we met this standard. Here's the backup documentation, perhaps that is either provided to the state in a desk audit that it could be uploaded to a website that state monitors could easily check off that pieces, pieces exist, or a state under the, under the IM's explanation could use a third party for that. That could theoretically be a state association. It could be an independent consulting firm. It could be a peer-to-peer -peer consultant model that a state may use to verify. But a third, an independent third party that could um, do that desk audit for the state would possibly be an option. But again, I don't I think there are a lot of different ways that we can talk about doing some of this work. 
And what we're going to be um, reinvigorating, I, we have a learning cluster for states on organizational standards. I know we have a number of states on the call, and we'll be convening that group again to talk more specifically about how this might work and how you can share best practices. Uh, again, because we know states don't have a lot of capacity, just like agencies don't have a lot of capacity, so we have to make sure this approach works for everybody on both sides of the equation. But states, you are going to have to probably come up with a system that's going to work in your individual state for you to when you submit your next state plan. And that process will need to be open to OCS for review. So, we, and we can come back to that here in a moment, but un, also here under assessment, states are responsible for that ensuring that the eligible entities meet all state established standards. Some states, or excuse me, some standards may take several years for eligible entities to meet. But the critical factor here is that agencies are making progress. Now, a strategic plan, as it's noted here, is one, is one of those elements. A strategic plan can take an agency three, six, nine months to kind of go through that process. If you're starting from scratch, that may be a harder process to kind of move off the dime. So there is some movement here that as long as an agency is showing movement, um, the agency um, is, is able to demonstrate to the state that they are making progress, and that needs to kind of be credited, I guess, in some way, shape, or form. We can talk about that as well. But let's talk about if a state, does, or the, in the monitoring process or in that assessment process, agencies aren't meeting a, set of, a standard or a set of standards. So the state's response will depend on circumstances. It's always that it depends, right? So in cases where the eligible entity may be able to meet the standard in a reasonable time frame, contingent on some targeted technical assistance, the state may choose and the entity may develop a technical assistance plan. We know a lot of the concern has been, well, Denise, you know, the IM and the Act, IM 116 and the Act talk about a corrective action plan. Corrective action plan can be a very scary place to be because that has a very high level of um, oversight to it possibly. This is giving states, and I think it's a, a great move to have that additional layer of a technical assistance plan. So if there are agencies missing some standards that, again, aren't going to necessarily be highly um, risky situations, I mean, there are some elements here that get to the CSBG Act and other elements that right now would trigger a corrective action plan. That doesn't really shift. But there are other elements here. A technical assistance plan is clearly an option here to help agencies and states work together to make sure agencies have time and the opportunity to meet the organizational standards. Um, if appropriate, in other situations, the state may initiate action, including the creation of a quality improvement plan. Some states may, may determine that there are situations where you need to have clear timelines and benchmarks. But I think this really does give states the flexibility. And most states that we've talked to kind of have this two-tier approach. This allows us to formalize it um, in a very concrete way, which I think is a very good thing. And this last bullet here on this slide, I think, is hopefully something that I know many people have been anxious about. As long as the state is confident that the eligible entity is moving toward meeting the standards under a technical assistance plan, a QIP, corrective action plan, or quality improvement plan, or another oversight mechanism, the state should not initiate action to terminate or reduce funding. I think that question came up a bit earlier on the, on the Q&A. What does this do for us if I don't meet standards? What does this do to termination of funding? Clearly it says here that if you're making progress through a plan, this is not in a place where a state would be initiating um, a termination or reduction of funding. But of course there's always an a however, right? The failure of an agency or an eligible entity, excuse me, to meet multiple standards may reflect deeper organizational challenges and risk. Now, this doesn't say if I miss two standards, that automatically triggers. This really, I believe, talks about more serious deficiencies and, and challenges of not meeting standards that are some of the core higher level of risk areas. And we can work with um, OCS and some states and agencies to talk about where that may be. But nothing here cancels IM 116. So in those cases, the state must determine whether it may be necessary to take additional actions, including reducing or terminating funding in accordance with CSBG IM 116, which is entitled Corrective Action, Termination, and Reduction of Funding, issued back in 2012. OCS and states do not have the authority under the Act to bypass this process in IM 116 in order to recompete CSBG funding. And we highlight here the monitoring map for the community action agencies. This resource was developed by CAP Law 
and the partnership in response to IM-116 that really breaks down the process for us lay people, right? We're not attorneys, so what does IM-116 really tell us about the process to go down that road? So I think these two slides and these elements in the IM hopefully give some, some comfort to some of the anxiety that's been out there over the years, what happens if. This gives states and agencies clear direction that a technical assistance plan is an appropriate way to go, that missing a couple of standards that, you know, can be fixed within a year, that, that have, then you're showing movement, there's no, there's no automatic turn down the termination route. And it's clear here that states can't negotiate around, and I know most states, you know, you don't have the capacity, you don't want to, you want to help agencies succeed. So I think this helps all of us, states, agencies, associations, to really say, we're going to have some clear processes here with some new opportunities to develop clear technical assistance plans that don't try to, that doesn't really bring us always to that QIP or corrective action route. It gives us another layer of technical assistance, which I think is a really positive aspect to this. But I know that was a lot, so I'm going to pause here to see if there were questions that came in specific to this um, information. So a question has come in. Do I understand correctly that all agencies must be a standard, assessed on the standards every year? That's how I read it, yes. That even if you're on a triannual review cycle, that every year the agencies are going to need to be assessed against the standards. That again, you may do that monitoring visit once every three years, you're on site, you're reviewing, you're having that conversation, you're documenting. In those alternate years where you're not on site or you're not doing that heavy duty monitoring, there's going to need to be a process where agencies talk about, yes, we met all of these standards or we missed these standards. And either the state's going to, going to verify that through a desk audit, you know, you say, oh, they submitted a copy of their strategic plan. They, they submitted a copy of their board minutes for the year and they highlighted, oh, here's where they talked about progress on their strategic plan. Here's where they made progress talking about their CAP plan. Here's where we really talked about the financial reports going to the board and the programmatic reports going to the board. Those kind of elements have documentation attached to them that necessarily wouldn't require an on-site visit. But I think what we read in the IM is that that verification that the agencies either have done their own self-assessment and it's accurate needs to be verified either by the state or by a third party. So that's, again, how I read the IM, that yes, all agencies are going to need to be assessed against all the standards every year. Question, what if a CAP agency is consistently not meeting just one standard? Is, it, is this addressed as multiple? I would not consider that a multiple standard issue. I think that would fall underneath, can it be addressed and amended within a year's time? I think one of the, the it also addressed either multiple standards or something that could be addressed within a year's time. But as now, if there's issues that come up in your monitoring that aren't addressed and that repeatedly come up, I think that would trigger um, a technical assistance plan to address. And again, if an agency doesn't improve on that, then the state needs to look again back to IM-116 and determine is that going to be enough for us to trigger a quality improvement plan or a corrective action plan and go down that road? And again, we can have some additional conversations beyond today about that, but again, I don't know if it fits into the multiple category, but I think it fits into that you have a window to improve. If you don't, what happens next? And we can, we'll have to probably get some additional clarity on that. So the standard says failure to meet multiple standards, so if there's only one standard that they aren't failing with, you can't proceed with IM-116 action. Um, no, I believe that the IM also talks about um, serious issues as well as possibly triggering, and nothing lets agencies off the hook with IM-116 either. So if there's a serious deficiency happening, um, we know several of the standards talk about um, board governance and meeting the act in terms of tripartite structure. Nothing here lets the agencies off the hook either for IM-116. So the standards are one piece, but there are going to be elements that fit within the act and fit within existing state monitoring that if you're missing um, repeatedly, then, then you're possibly could end up, I would think, in a corrective action plan situation and possibly the IM-116. But again, that's just Denise talking. That's just an official guidance. Follow-up question, not multiple no, not multiple standards, for instance, constantly not with, oh, specifically around the tripartite board standards. We're going to do, this is still early for us, right, getting the IM. So 
I think those are good questions for us to put in the hot topic area for some additional conversations with OCS, because our understanding is that there are some critical elements like the tripartite board piece that don't just fit into that, you take some time to fix it. Those are the core elements similar to the OMB issues that are in the stands around finance that really need to be fixed within a more reasonable amount of time that don't let agents, that, you know, we have to comply with the act. We have to comply with our tripartite structure. So the way I would interpret it is that that's not one of those things that can kind of go into that TA plan or if it's repeatedly not met. I think you have to work with your agencies like you do now consistently what are the processes to fill board seats, what's the appropriate window of time. We know board seats don't get filled overnight, and we know that that takes the time to, to make progress uh, as, as it does now. So I know I'm stumbling over my answer a bit, but you're, you're not going right into an IM-116 situation now when a board is not meeting a tripartite structure. You're working with them to fill those seats, make sure they have a plan, make sure they're making progress down that road. So we can talk more about that as we develop additional guidance and, and give some more thought to that. So thank you for raising the tripartite issue specifically. Well, states set timelines out in the future when they expect all agencies to fully meet standards knowing that agencies are starting out now at different levels. The way I read the IM is that when they propose, when states may put their state plan into place by September 1st of this year or amend what they submitted last year, they're going to have to talk about what does our rollout plan look like, how do we convey the expectation that agencies meet 100 percent, what's our technical assistance plan look like, what's that process look like, feel like for an agency who might be missing standards. But it is a block grant, so states have some flexibility here in terms of what that first year is going to kind of look like a bit. I think the expectation, though, that we see in the IM that agencies will meet all standards. And we see in the, in the assessment process that agencies need to be documenting progress toward meeting the standards. So we'll see what um, that's going to need to look like as we go forward. Would I elaborate a little bit more on the third-party verification of the self-assessment, and will a peer review meet that requirement? I think that's a really good question. We're definitely going to have that on our hot topic area to talk a bit more with OCS and um, others about how we frame that up in terms of guidance. Um, I would think that a, a self-assessment that's verified by a, a group that's been identified as a peer-reviewed group would meet that requirement. But um, again, that's going to have to be up to individual states and agencies and associations to come to an agreement in their state. What's that comfort level? What's that agreement look like for that peer review process? Um, is there a peer review team that kind of takes that on to verify that we've assessed their, their checkoff list and their backup documentation and we've signed off that those things are in alignment? So I think we're going to have to give some thought to that, but I think a peer review process is going to be an option. Um, it's the way I read uh, the documents here. Question, do I have an example of a TNCA plan? Um, that is certainly something that we are, um, we our risk mitigation uh, uh, steering committee actually has a subcommittee working on a technical assistance plan strategy, and we have a draft document that is getting very close for prime time, and I think that is something that we're going to be able to provide uh, to agencies and states around a technical assistance plan uh, that lays out, again, what's going to happen, who's going to do it, what are the time frames. Nothing overly complex, but I know sometimes it's easier to have a tool at your fingertips to put into practice, so yes. All right, so let's move on here and talk a bit more about implementation and um, some other elements. Implementation, states must follow a process that is consistent with state rules and that is fair and reasonable as process. I know many states and agencies and associations have had conversations. I'm going to pause here, and I know I always make the commercial to make sure you read your state plan draft. This is extra important this year. You're going to definitely want to read the state plan document. You're going to want to attend the state hearing that they have on their state plan so you can hear them talk about it. You want to be able to give your feedback and be part of that conversation. The states need to allow for input from boards and leadership of eligible entities on the timing and procedures for implementing, documenting, or reporting on the standards. We saw this in the draft I am earlier this year, or last year, excuse me, where they really hope that agencies and states and associations, boards and staff are talking, and this really is a, a collegial coming to agreement on how this is going to happen in our individual states. That states are going to integrate org standards in their state plans, contracts, funding documents, et cetera, and hopefully states have been going through down that road with their legal departments and otherwise since that draft I am came out. 
uh, to start this process. Clearly communicate what the expectations are around organizational standards. Again, that's why it's going to be critical for you to read those state plans this year uh, on what that process is going to look like. And again, the IM talks about that you're only, states are only going to modify these organizational standards um, once they're publicly, they're only modify organizational standards based on established state rules and processes uh, that are publicly communicated and, and transparent. And again, here it clears, they talk about in the IM recommending using the COE developed standards and they're designed as a comprehensive complete set that if you make minor modification states, you're, you're still going to need OCS approval to do that in your state plan. And there may be states out there who are going to want to make some modifications. And we're going to talk about here some, some interesting pieces in the IM that talk about what about really small grantees. And I know there are several places in the, across the country where people get very small amounts of money. So we'll talk about that here in a moment. So state plans. States are also going to be under the gun a bit just because it's going to shift in terms of how they're going to do their state plan. This is going to be submitted electronically and uploaded uh, through a new system. And there is um, that, that's what I talked about that came out last night, uh, the new um, online tool. And we have links up on our website or will soon about how you can go see that information. But here the state plan will need to describe whether the state is using the COE developed standards or a different set of standards. Again, the process for officially rolling them out the process by which they're going to assess you, the process for corrective action plan or technical assistance, and again, any exceptions for limited purpose agencies or very small grantees, if that's applicable. We're going to talk about what that says in the IM specific uh, to those small grantees. And again, then the states will need to report on the progress of the of the standards through the annual report. So that IS report at the end of the day, at the end of the year, is going to, again, going to have some modifications to it. So Denise, I'm a very small grantee. Is, are these going to apply to me? What are the exceptions? Now, they define or recommend in the IM kind of what they see as small budgets or small grants. So many CAP agencies, most, these are very small level exceptions. So the vast majority of agencies are going to need to meet the organizational standards, but there are a couple places here where there are some special circumstances. Limited purpose agencies, we get that question a lot. What about limited purpose? Are the standards going to have to apply to those? And I know some states there are limited purpose agencies, so it may be good to kind of compile that list, see if there are any questions, because you're still going to have to come up with some set of standards that are going to have to address them, it just that may not be the COE standards. State-funded tribal organizations. We know many tribal organizations are funded directly by OCS. The, the IM does not apply to those groups. The way we, if I recall, tribal organizations that receive CSBG funding directly from the feds are not included in IM 138. So those direct funded tribal grantees will be direct, there's going to be different activities going on there. But through state-funded tribal organizations, again, the states are going to need to do something for those groups, but it may not be the COE developed standards. Migrant and seasonal farm worker organizations, again, different, a little bit different structure, a little bit different focus. There's going to be a different level of standards. And here's where you get the small budgets, but these are budgets under $50,000. That's agency-wide budget. Those are very, very small. And there are caps out there that have very teeny tiny budgets or very minor CSBG allocations recommended, for instance, under $15,000. Now, these say EG, right? So, for instance, but we're not talking a small budget being a, um, a million dollar organization. Um, we're talking very small organizations or CSBG allocation. We're not talking, well, I only get $200,000, Denise. You know, they're talking much smaller CSBG allocations. Um, I don't mean to call out Colorado, but Colorado is in a situation across the country where we have agencies, designated entities getting very small amounts of money, five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. But you can see here that as appropriate, states should describe other types of appropriate standards for these accepted entities. So they're not let off the hook, as it were, I don't mean to quite put it that way, but they don't have to use the COE developed standards or use these broad scope. There are some exceptions here for some very specific situations. Any other questions that have come in at the moment? In the IM, there are some components here that um, just wanted to bring your attention to. There are some time frames. These tables are right in the IM here about OCS responsibilities, what their time frame looks like. 
state responsibilities about establishing standards when the state plans are due, um, starting federal fiscal year 2016. Um, a question came in a bit earlier about our state says that we now have to comply with the standards because the IM is out, even though it's not yet federal fiscal year 2016. We're going to have to get some clarification on that particular question, so be patient with us. But we did record that, and we will come back to that, come back to you with information, not today. We'll do a bit more research on that because it is that federal fiscal year 2016 component, but I know some states have kind of moved um, forward um, on that. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you about that specifically. And then CSBG eligible entity pieces, um, conducting self-assessments, planning for adoption. We've been beating that drum for a while, haven't we? Get ready now, get ready right now, get ready now. And just to let folks know that our board here at the partnership has made it a clear element of our strategic plan that the partnership will assess ourselves against all 58 standards to see where we stand. Now, not all of them may have quite a clear A equals A, but our board is committed, and I am as well, that our organization here at the partnership will assess ourselves against these standards as well. So um, we're, in, we're in the pool with you on, on that as well. The IM also has several appendices um, that talk about, again, the individual, it just finalizes the center of excellence to find standards. So you'll see Appendix 2 and Appendix 3 are the COE developed standards. And again, the tables are there as well. It talks, um, there are, Appendix 4 does get to uh, the key considerations that states are going to need to walk through um, as they go through to implement the organizational standards. So I'm going to pause here again before we move into the other communications that have come out this week that, in, that intersect with organizational standards. Let's see if any other big questions that have come in. How will the IM apply to migrant and seasonal farm worker organizations Will the state directly decide on the different set of standards? and their application to migrant and seasonal farm worker organizations. The way I would interpret the IM and the uh, appendices that go with it is that the state should be working with those particular agencies, and I would also argue associations, on what appropriate standards might look like for migrant and seasonal farm worker organizations. They're going to have to come up with something, but I think that's always probably done better in partnership. I think that's the spirit of what the IM talks about, that those conversations should be happening. So I have no definitive answers for you today, um, but we'll definitely put it on our hot topic list to get back to you, because I think it's interesting to see the exceptions. Now we have to reply to the exceptions and help states, as well as agencies, figure that part out. Okay. <coughs> <laughs> uh, for grantees with delegate agencies, um, are the OCS, are the organizational standards required for um, delegate agencies compliance and reporting? They, it's, I'd have to do another quick scan of the IM. I don't recall seeing the term delegate agencies. Again, been on the road this weekend. I haven't looked at that specifically. Previous conversations, though, would imply me saying no, it does not mean delegate agencies need to comply with the organizational standards. It is that primary grantee eligible entity. So we'll get some clarification. We'll put that in the hot topic list as well. <laughs> Can I define limited purpose agencies? <coughs> well, it's, it's kind of, if you are one, you know you're one. Um, if you're at a state that has them, you kind of know you have them because you, you've kind of called them out. Um, we have done some work about a year ago to get some definitions around limited purpose agencies. They were established at the time, I believe, as when the block grants came into, into I haven't looked at that definition recently, my apologies, but is when the block grant happened, some agencies were formulated as limited purpose agencies. They may even be older than that, many of them. We can put up some definitions. Maybe we can actually put that in the glossary around, um, excuse me, limited purpose agencies to make sure that we're all on the same page with that. I think that's, that's, I'm glad you raised that. We'll put that into our hot topic, add to the glossary of definitions. But for now, if you are one, you know you're one, and if you are a state that has them, odds are you know that they are who they are. So sorry for the convoluted response on that. Is the delegate agency the same term for an agency as a public cap might subcontract to? Yes, um, that's a good example, that if you're a public cap that you sub out, you do some work yourselves, or you sub it out, those other CBOs, community-based organizations, or faith-based groups, or others that you sub out that work to are your delegates. And actually, some nonprofit caps also have delegate agencies that they may sub some resources out to and have that delegate agency relationship to. Both of those would be termed delegate agency, and I think that's another good term for us to put into our glossary of terms 
as something that we need to make sure we flag. So thank you. Any other questions? All right, good, good questions. And keep an eye on the clock as well, And I, but I know that you want to definitely walk through this information, so. All right, so it's been a busy week for OCS, uh, getting this information out the door. Um, glad to have it all out. It's all out here in January. It's also out before uh, the federal budget. So we're able to uh, show that we are being responsive. So this, this is all good. I know it's a lot of information to try to absorb all at one time. So a Dear Colleague letter came out on the 28th. I believe that was Wednesday. I was actually in a presentation with a state um, group um, in Ohio, actually, where the state agency was uh, presenting at the moment that this hit my inbox. So it was great to kind of have that hit um, at the same time. But the accountability measures really kind of capture the performance data about the critical elements and functions performed by the states and by the feds. I kind of use the parlance standards for states, standards for feds. I know they don't, but that's how I kind of frame them up, that uh, these state elements are activities described in the state plan and what elements the state efforts have on the performance of local entities. Now, go, let's go to the next slide here real quick. There are 13 accountability measures in here for states. They form up in a couple of different categories. Distribution of funds, the use of remainder or discretionary resources, grantee monitoring and corrective action, data collection, analysis and reporting, organizational standards, like how many agencies met 100% of standards, for instance, and state leakages and communication. Same thing on the federal side, uh, very similar, I believe there, are, oh, I wanna say there are 12 on the Fed side, very similar categories. I know this says state and federal accountability measures, and I know the states are gonna do a deep dive into this stuff, and we'll see what we can do to make sure there's a, more information coming out on that, but on the agency side, I encourage you as local agencies to also read this Dear Colleague letter. Look to see what's in these accountability measures to see where states are gonna to need to be reporting. It is things like getting money out within a certain window of time, which I know is very important to both states and agencies, that that money, once it comes into states, it gets back out the door to local agencies in a timely way. Same thing with monitoring reports. State, state comes out and monitors. What's the time window where you get your report back? I know you want to know that information and what those timings need to look like. Same thing on the federal side. States want their monitoring reports. So states, I encourage you to read the federal accountability measures because very similar things. What's the timing that OC has, OCS when the money is available to get it to the states so you can get it to the agencies? When you get your monitoring reports, what's the timing for you to get your monitoring reports? So while these might necessarily apply to us specifically, I encourage the entire network to be familiar with this particular document. And finally, yesterday, the model state plan. The Dear Colleague letter came out yesterday. I honestly have not had a deep dive opportunity yet to, to look at all the specifics on this. This is really the piece where we've been talking about the LMB clearances necessary. The Dear Colleagues letter basically says, hey, network, we've sent the, the draft model state plan to OMB for clearance. This state plan model is gonna have a 60-day window for open comment. So we're gonna be looking at this. We may be offering comment. I encourage the network to take a look to offer comment. We may be looking at coalescing around some comments. Uh, to make to OMB about this process, but this is kind of where we started off the conversation. The OMB clearance is really around the data collection system. That's kind of where we're having to hang our hat on that process. So this will, um, if you take a look and you, you click on the link to the model state plan, then we're going to, um, you're gonna be able to see what elements the states are gonna need to be putting into their state plan, including around organizational standards. The state plan will see have issues around streamlining, automation, and performance management integration. I encourage you to click on section six, where it addresses organizational standards. You'll see the questions that the states will have to answer in their state plan. And the more we learn about this, the more information we will definitely send out to you. We look forward to the NASCAS conference later this month, where, or later in February, where we're going to um, be able to um, learn more specifically about how states are going to be addressing that state plan and we'll be back in communication with the network certainly after that time as well. So questions and comments that have come in on any of that so far? No, okay. Thank you for hanging on with us. I know we have some folks dropping off. We're coming up on our time. 
just want to make sure folks are familiar with the tools and resources up on our website. We have our glossary of terms that we talked about that we'll be adding to. Let's keep um, one next slide. We have our online assessment. You can download this in Word or PDF to help your agencies and or states. Some states have taken this tool and modified it for use. We have a variety of tools up on our website to help you meet the standards. We have a two-pager also for boards that you can download and get to your organization. Go to the next slide. You'll see here, where can I get these tools, Denise? Upper right-hand corner, National Training Center. Click on that, that'll take you to our tools and resources. Left-hand side, you'll see the um, update on org standards. That's where today's webinar will be posted. And here, as you can see, when you click on that update page, you'll see here we have a link to the um, IM-138. We have a link currently to the Dear Colleague Letter, and we'll make sure to get the link to the Dear Colleague Letter on the model state plan up there as well. We have our TNCA Resource Center where we post a lot of information. There are a ton of resources. We post everything also in this where you can access all of our tools and resources are up in this tool that was developed again in partnership with um, CSBG, TNCA Resources from OCS and our friends over at NASCAS. And I think those are the big pieces that we wanted to make sure we walk through today. And um, again, um, our email information is available. Please email me with additional comments. So, a question has come in. Um, please speak to the implementation of Roma Next Generation, specifically how and if agencies will be monitor or ascertain whether or not agencies are weaving Roma into their plans. I am probably not in a position to be able to talk specifically about that particular question here today, so my apologies. Um, but we will get you some more information about Roma Next Generation, and I know that NAVCAP will be do, has done a number of webinars on Roma Next Gen, and um, we'll, we'll work with them to get more information specific to that question um, back out in the field. Um, what other questions have come in? Will OCS be developing standards for non-community action agencies that receive discretionary funding through the state? Interesting question. Um, I have not heard of um, that happening, but I think that's a fascinating question, um, seeing how they're not quite delegates, right? Maybe they need to fit under some of those exception places. We'll have to talk to OCS and to the states a bit more about that discretionary um, grants and, and what happens to those grantees in terms of organizational standards and any sort of standards. So thank you for raising that. Can you expand on the term of meeting 100% of the organizational standards? I probably can. Uh, I think it really does get to the, the states need to set the expectation that agencies will meet 100% of whatever standards the states set. If you're using the org standards that the COE developed, there's an expectation that agencies, agencies will meet 100% of these standards. We've been telling agencies there's going to be an expectation that you need to be, you meet 100% of these standards in fiscal year 2016. So we're going to have to figure out exactly, does that, I've always argued that I'd be ready to rock on 10-1-2015, the start of fiscal year 2016. But this will be the plan, the, 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 the ramp up here. So we're going to have to talk a bit more specifically about what that means, what the timing looks like. And I encourage you as states to have conversations with your agency so you can determine what that means in your state office. Now, OCS um, may have some additional guidance on that as well. We'll be uh, turning to them as well, and if they do a webinar or if they do additional guidance on some of this information, we'll make sure to get that out. I know with the uh, NASCAP conference later this month, we'll be talking and learning more as we go through. And as soon as we have information, we will definitely provide that to you. Other question. Is it, or when do you expect self-assessment tool on the website will be updated to include the new standards? Very good question. Um, we will work to get the new the standards the new standards in there as quickly as possible. If you can give us a, a, a two week window here um, to make all the modifications. There's a lot of tweaks here and there with additional language, but we'll work in the next uh, two weeks to have those updated with new tools up on the website. I just don't see staff's heads exploding quite yet with that two week window, but I ask for a little bit of patience uh, to to have those added. So thank you. Is it safe to say that agencies that are not eligible entities receiving discretionary money will not be subject to the standard? This would include associations, correct? That's my understanding that right now, I don't I haven't seen discretionary funding mentioned in the IM. As far as I know, it's CHBG eligible entities 
that are going to be held to the organizational standards. We'll get some additional clarification. But everything that I've read so far has been CSBG eligible entity, which would not, which would apply to me, not discretionary grantees. Has the risk assessment tool been revised to meet the changes in the IM? Um, not yet. Um, we'll have to look. What we can do is we'll be in touch with Melanie Herman at the Nonprofit Risk Management Center, um, provide her with the additional statements, especially around the comprehensive nature, and see if there are elements in that risk assessment tool that would need to be modified based on the IM. So thank you for raising that. Any other big core questions? I know a lot of questions have come in that we'll, we'll certainly do a sort through and see if there are other questions that need to be answered as we go through. Okay. All right, so we, again, we will have recorded today's webinar. We will look to get updated assessment tools up on the website within the next two weeks. When we learn more, we will share more. Um, we'll be meeting with states um, within the learning cluster for states and talk more about what this means in terms of that triannual monitoring. We, again, are offering to the ARPICs and the regions to do regional-based calls so we can do uh, the dialogue like we did during the listening sessions, unmute people so you can ask, ask your questions specifically without me having to interpret um, what you've put in the chat window. Um, thank you so much for being on today's webinar. Please send us follow-up questions if you have them, and I'm sure there are. Um, we'll be on the road quite a bit between now and the end of July at a lot of state association events and national events. Our convention in August, which will be in San Francisco, will certainly address organizational standards. The timing of that will be interesting. It'll be right before those state plans are due. So we'll have a lot more information as we go through here, the, the winter, spring, which is on the horizon, hopefully, and then summer. I know it feels, those of you buried in snow and, and very cold temps today, that seems like a long way away, but it will be here. So with that, I will close out today's webinar. Thank you so much for being on, and we look forward to talking to you soon. Take care.